Good evening, BookTube, YouTube. This is Johnny. Time to make a video. It's been a couple of days. It is a Friday night here in West Michigan. It is February the 21st. It's a Friday. It is 9-11 at night. My wife went back to work tonight. She can't wait till she can just retire. She didn't want to go to work. She just wants to retire and just stay home and so she's counting off the shifts. She works tonight and tomorrow night and her knees are really bothering her and it's just not like when she was younger. Yeah, my wife and I have been married 41 years. I remember when I first met her, she was, I think we got married when we were 28, we're 27 years old. And now she's 67 and I'll be 68 this year. So yeah, I have my aches and pains. I told you I, I damaged both my aunt, aunt, arms and hands. And so I'm constantly in pain, but it's not unbearable. But yeah, it's Friday night, Friday night reads. But something I wanna, this video is gonna be devoted to something. I got a comment, I mentioned, uh, in my one of my recent video, videos <laughs> that I have been reading Unity and Con Continuity and Covenantal Thought, a study in the Reformed Tradition to the Westminster Assembly by Andrew A. Woosley. And I showed uh, the Reformed Confessions, uh, the uh, was a harmony of the Reformed Confessions harmonizing the three forms of unity, the Belgic, the Cans of Dort, the Heidelberg, with the Westminster Standards, larger and shorter catechism. And I had a comment where someone said, could you direct me to some books on how to study or give theological exposition or historical background in the Westminster Standards? Westminster Confession of Faith and so I thought I would do that instead of just writing a huge comment <laughs> I would just show the books. Now the reason why I have these books is because as I've said over the years I've been making videos I was going my when I became a Christian in 1970 I just wanted to be a soul winner. I wanted just to bring people to Christ and and present the gospel. And then in 1975, uh, I became a Calvinist. I came into the Reformed faith, the doctrines of sovereign free grace. And when I was, at that time, I was working at the Richmond Rescue Mission. I had my time lined up. This is, uh, I was born in 1952, and it says here that in 1973, I joined the staff of the Richmond Rescue Mission. And when I was there, uh, through reading the writings of C.H. Spurgeon, A.W. Pink, and the Puritans, the 17th century English Puritans, I came into Reformed faith and then I discovered that there was a denomination in Berkeley, California, the Orthodox Presbyterian Church there in Berkeley, very small church, 20 people, that held to the doctrines of, the doctrines of sovereign free grace and, and held to the Westminster Standards. And so I joined that church, and it, it, there were some good and bad experiences. I won't go into that in this video. But when I joined that church, I had to go through a year of going through the Shorter Catechism. You have, the, in the Westminster Standards, you have the Larger and Shorter Catechism, and I had to meet with the minister, I think it was once a month, or once, I don't know, we met regularly, and after I went through a year of studying the Westminster Stan Westminster Shorter Catechism, I 
was able to join the OPC. The point is that when you join a conservative Presbyterian church, the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, the Reformed Presbyterian Church, uh, the PCA, Presbyterian Church in America, which is the church that my wife is a member of, that they tell you that they are confessional, that they hold to the Westminster Standards. And, and when you join the church, you know, you go to a membership class, and I've never been to one of these membership classes that the church that my wife goes to, but I can assume that they tell the people who want to become members that we hold to these confessions the Confession of Faith of the Westminster Standards, the Larger and Shorter Catechism. And then, which is Calvinistic, covenantal, hold to infant baptism, uh, you know, ruled by teaching and ruling elders, church discipline, uh, they oversight the sacraments, the Lord's Supper, you have to, they guard the Supper, meaning that when you want to take part of the Lord's Supper, you have to ask the elders, or you, they, they warn people, do not partake of the, of the sacrament unless you are a Christian, and that you're living a holy life. If you're living in sin, or you're not a Christian, they tell people, before, don't partake, please, because there are warnings in the New Testament that if you eat and drink of the wine and the bread and you are living in sin and that you're not a Christian, that you can bring judgment upon yourself. So they warn people. They guard, this, they guard the communion table. That's all I'm saying. So anyway, to make a long story short, I was just going to show you some books. <laughs> now the reason why they, why one of the, when I came into the Reformed faith, I came out of the charismatic, dispensational, baptistic, Jesus movement, and the 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 reason why they have confessions of faith and why they they tell people that you can't become members of the church unless you swear to uphold these things. And if, you, if you're an office bearer, if you're a teaching or ruling elder, you can't teach anything or preach anything that's contrary to the confession of faith. If you do, then you are disqualified. You can't hold office. And that's what happened to me. Now with me, it wasn't in the Presbyterian church. It was in the Dutch Reformed independent church, which held, holds to the Heidelberg, the Belgic, and the Cairns of Dort, which means that when you, when you hold an office where you teach or preach in that Dutch Calvinistic church, you cannot teach or preach anything that is not set forth in the Heidelberg Confession, the Cairns of Dort, the Heidelberg Catechism, the Cairns of Dort, and the Belgic and if you do, you get in trouble. <laughs> With me, they said I could no longer teach adult Sunday school. I can't hold any, I can't hold an office of an elder, a deacon. I can't exercise any spiritual, my spiritual gifts in conservative Calvinistic churches because I am not orthodox. Now, I love the Lord Jesus Christ. I love the Word of God. I'm conservative. I'm Bible believing. Uh, I believe in the five points of Calvinism, but because I don't hold to classical covenantal theology, I am. I can't really join any church now because I'm not Baptistic. I'm not a Methodist. I'm not Pentecostal. I'm not Charismatic. I'm not Lutheran. I'm not Catholic. I'm not Eastern Orthodox, I'm not non-denominational, I'm not Plymouth Brethren, I am a conservative, reformed, biblical, Bible-believing son of God. <laughs> At least that's what my desire is. 
Now, I, as I mentioned over these videos, that I struggle with assurance of salvation. I have, lately I've been having very dark times, and I'm just clinging to the cross. But I just keep going on. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you these books. Now, this is one of the books. This is a Confession of Faith by A.A. A. Hodge. A.A. A. Hodge lived from 1823 and he died in 1886. He was a the son of the very famous American Calvinistic theologian Charles Hodge. You can buy Charles Hodge's three volume systematics. I have them downstairs in the lower level. And he taught theology for many years and then he wrote this exposition on the Confession of Faith, a handbook of Christian doctrine expounding the Westminster Confession. This is by A.A. A. Hodge. You can buy it from the Banner of Truth Trust. And then there's this one. Uh, let me see here. There's another one. Where'd it go? Well, here it is. <laughs> This is the Exposition of the Confession of Faith by Robert Shaw. Robert Shaw lived from 1795 and he died in 1863. He was a Scottish... Uh, I think he was a Scottish... He was a professor of systematics. And this is his Exposition of the Confession of Faith by Robert Shaw. So you can buy this. This is available. Any, you know, you can buy this. It's still available. And then, this is the Presbyterian Standards. This was published by the Southern Presbyterian Press. The, the Presbyterian Standards: An Exposition of the Conf Westminster Confession of Faith and the Catechisms. So in this, you have not only an exposition of the Confession of Faith, but also of the larger shorter catechism. And then you have this work that came out in the 18th century. This is a commentary on the larger catechism by Thomas Ridgely. This is volumes one and two. This is really massive. <laughs> Look at that. It's really small print. Look at that. Uh, so this is going through the larger catechism and as you, it goes through each of the questions of the larger catechism and it expounds them. It's almost like a body of divinity. It's called a commentary on the larger catechism, previously titled A Body of Divinity, wherein the doctrines of the Christian religion are explained, defended, being the sub substance of several lectures on the Assembly's larger catechism by Thomas Ridgely, Doctor of Divinity, and this was first, this edition came out in 1553, and it was reprinted in May of 1993. So if you want a really exhaustive exposition of the larger catechism, you can pick up this. Also, these were I used when I was at that OPC church in Berkeley many years ago. The Westminster Confession of Faith for Study Classes by G. I. Williamson. And then you have a study books for the, Sh the Shorter Catechism, Volume 1, Questions 1 to 38, and Questions 39 to 107, Volume 2. So you can buy these in any Christian bookstore. And then if you want historical background in the Westminster Assembly and its work, you can find in the works of B.B. Warfield. I have a, this is B.B. Warfield. He was a professor of theology at Princeton, New Jersey at the turn of the century. I have his all his writings, his, his works, and in his Works of Benjamin Warfield in volume 6. You, he has a volume, The Westminster Assembly and its work. So, 
This is in volume six, I think. Yeah, it has chapters, the Westminster Assembly and its work, to the making of the Westminster Confession, especially of its chapters on the decree of God. Three, the Westminster Doctrine of Holy Scripture. Chapter four, the Doctrine of Inspiration of the Westminster Divines. Question, uh, chapter five, the printing of the Westminster Confession. And chapter six, the first question of the Westminster Shorter Catechism. Now the first question of the Shorter Catechism is very famous. It says here, oh, anyway, it's very famous. <laughs> uh, if I have my book here, let me see, find it in the Shorter Catechism. Where is my confession? See, this is my edition of the Westminster Confession. I got this when I was working on staff at the Richmond Rescue Mission. It was sent to me by the Banner of Truth Trust. It was a gift. I got it in the mail back in 1975. And it's the Confession of Faith of the Large and Shorter Catechisms with the Scripture Proofs at Large together with a Sum of Saving Knowledge. And this was published in Scotland by the Free Presbyterians. And as you look at this Shorter Catechism, as I mentioned, what is the first question? What is the chief end of man? That's the first question of the Shorter Catechism. What is the chief end of man? Answer. Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. Question two. What rule... What rule has God given to direct us how we may glorify and enjoy Him? Answer, the Word of God which is contained in the Scripture of the Old and New Testament is the only rule to direct us how we may glorify and enjoy Him. Question 3. What do the Scriptures principally teach? The Scriptures principally teach what man is to believe concerning God, and what duty God requires of man? Question four. What is God? God is a spirit, infinite, eternal, unchangeable in his being, wisdom, power, holiness, and justice, goodness, and truth. Question five. Are there more gods than one? Answer. There is but one, only the living and true God. Question six. How many persons are there in the Godhead? There are three persons in the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and Holy Ghost. And these three are one. One God, the same in substance, equal in power and glory. Question seven, what are the decrees of God? The, the decrees of God are the, His eternal purpose according to the counsel of His will, whereby for His own glory He has ordained whatever comes to pass. How does God execute His decrees? He executes His decrees in the works of creation and providence. See, so what a minister does, now this is not true in all conservative Presbyterian churches, but he will preach through the Shorter Catechism. He'll take one of those questions, look at the script, find this is all based on scripture, and he'll preach a text that expounds that question from the Shorter Catechism. Because as you look at, the, uh, when you look at the Shorter Catechism, for example, I just read you the, the, uh, the, an the questions and answers, but if you look, they have all scripture proofs at the bottom. They quote scripture where they find this truth that is set forth in the question. It's just not made up by man. They're drawing from scripture what is the chief end of man? Of course, it is to know God and to enjoy Him forever. I think that's how it goes. <laughs> Let me see here. I have a very short memory. Short memory. Shorter catechism. Let me see here. What is the chief end of man? Man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. So, and you can study that by using these books, the Shorter Catechism uh, workbooks. You can also, if you want some more background in the Westminster Assembly, I have this. 
the Westminster Assembly, Its History and Standards, The Bard Lecture, 1882, by Alexander F. Mitchell. And then I have History of the Westminster Assembly Divines by William M. Hithington. So, yeah. Also, uh, it's good, you know, when I first was exposed to Westminster Standards, I got it through the reading the Puritans. And if you read the writings of William Perkins, this is volume eight. If you were to get all 10 volumes of the William Perkins, he, his theology and his practical divinity is set forth in the Westminster Standards because they were all, I mean, he is the father of Puritanism and all the, the Puritans who compose the Westminster Assembly, the Westminster Standards, they were Scottish and English divines, and I think they were also maybe some Dutch theologians. I can't remember for sure. I also been, as far as my Friday reads, I've been reading the Puritans, the Transatlantic History by David A. Hall. This is a good book too. There's in this book there's uh, information on the Westminster Assembly because the New England Puritans, when they crossed the Atlantic and they settled in the colonies, they were, they held to the theology of the Westminster Standards, which you'll find in 19th century church history. I just showed you the writings of, of Warfield, B.B. Warfield and A.A. A. Hodge. They were Calvinists and they held to the teachings of the Westminster Assembly. They were conservative Presbyterians. So yeah, I don't know what else to show you. But if you read all these books, you should get a good understanding of the history of the Westminster Standards, the Westminster Assembly, uh, 17th century English confessional theology, uh, stuff on the large and shorter catechism of the Westminster Standards. And so yeah, reason, so like going back why I have these books, well if I was going to be ordained in a Presbyterian church, I would preach from the Westminster Standards. <laughs> I would read it at least <laughs> and I would instruct in Sunday school classes, teach classes on the Shorter Catechism, teach classes on the Westminster Confession of Faith. And so I would have to have some resources because if you're in some areas of the United States, you don't have access to libraries or bookstores where you can buy these books. Now, what you might find very interesting, most of our Christian life, we've sat under the preaching of the Heidelberg Catechism, the Dutch Reformed Confessions, the Heidelberg, the Delgin, the the Heidelberg Catechism and the Belgic and the Cans of Dort. And uh, I have a I have a larger collection of those kinds of books than I do of the Westminster Standards because uh, I was really into conf I was really into Reformed confessional theology. Uh, I'm like I said I, I'm a student of Reformed theology. I'm a student of Dutch Reformed theology. I'm a student of Presbyterian Reformed theology. I am a student of classical covenantal theology of the Reformed tradition. That's why I'm reading, <laughs> why I'm reading, where's that book? Why I'm reading, let me see here. Why I'm reading in the mornings for devotions Unity and Continuity and Covenantal Thought, Study and Reform Tradition to the Westminster Assembly by Andrew A. Woosley. I am a student of covenant theology, but I'm also a student of biblical theology, a student of New Testament theology, Pauline theology. I'm a student of Christian spirituality, church history, history of the development of doctrine, history of biblical interpretation, 
And you know what I find so interesting is that I haven't gone to church in almost 12 or 13 years. And if, and there's people at the church that my wife goes to who know me. And I always imagine if, if I was to go back to church this coming Sunday, they say, Johnny, what have you been doing all these years? And I say, I've been studying the Bible. I've been praying. I've been contemplating. I've been seeking to live a righteous and holy life. I've been seeking to love the Lord Jesus Christ. I've been seeking to be a light in the dark in the darkness. I've been seeking to set forth the beauties and the glories of Christ. That's what I've been doing. I, I haven't gone on any vacations. I rarely leave the house except to volunteer at the local library used bookstore or go to thrift stores or go grocery shopping. Uh, I don't go to bars. I don't play pool. I don't... Uh, play darts. I don't uh, play football. I'm not into playing tennis. I'm not a long distance runner. I don't lift weights. I don't smoke. I don't chew tobacco. I don't, uh, I don't do anything except read books, <laughs> study the Bible, and pray and seek after God. So that's why I tell those people at church who, who knew me back when we were members at Messiah's Independent Reformed Church. Uh, what have you been doing all these years? I said, well, I get up in the morning, I pray, I read the Bible, and I read Christian books until the noontime, and then I doze, and I write, and I read books. I got this book in the mail this week. I've been reading this as far as secular literature. I got the new William T. Volman book, Lucky Star. I read this all last night until almost 11.30 at night. So yeah, but this is my life. Also, if you want, uh, if you want a good, st uh, a Bible that sets forth the, the teachings of the Westminster Standards, this is the the Spirit of the Reformation Study Bible. In the back of it, you have the Westminster Standards is in the back. The Canons of Dort, the Westminster Confession of Faith. Also, you can get this Bible, the Nave Study Bible. King James Version, we got this, my wife and I, when we first were dating 41 years ago. In this, in the back, is a whole section on the covenant of grace, outline on the Holy Trinity, outline on the sovereignty of God. It, uh, see, it has an outline on the covenant of grace. I used this Bible when I was in Bible college and seminary, in my doctrinal classes. When I took systematics, I had to the doctrine of God, the doctrine of salvation, the doctrine of man, the doctrine of the last things, uh, church history. I even took a class, a whole semester, a class on the covenant of grace, on covenant theology. I studied covenant theology for <laughs> at least 40 years, maybe 45 years. But you know what is so ironic is that, like I've said, I can't hold, I can't teach the Bible, I can't teach doctrine, I can't, I can't exercise my gift in any kind of church, because I don't strictly hold to the Westminster standards. I mean, you can love the Lord Jesus Christ, you can, you can be seeking after God, and seeking to be biblical and seeking to be a Christian, and that's not enough in Calvinistic churches. You have to hold and embrace fully what is taught in this theological system. And to me, I can't do that. Now, I can go, I'll, I go by the Bible. <laughs> I go by the Holy Scripture. If it's in the Bible, I'll believe it. And not everything in the doctrines of man in theological systems, Arminianism, Calvinism, es you know, dispensationalism, all millennialism, puritanism, nothing is free from error because they're made by sinful men. Men cannot set forth a perfect system of doctrine. Now they can they can seek to be as close as they can, but we're all blind. We all have our blind spots, and I, I even I do. 
I mean, I admit, you know, I'm not infallible. I'm, and so I'm always pr 